Hello, um, everybody. Juan from the OECD. So, so I think we have already a lot of persons on board, and we have we are with a uh, with, uh, very small five minutes delay. So I think we should start. I can give the floor, of course, to to Marta Norris, our chairman, to, to start leading the session, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to welcome everybody to our second webinar on delivering an improved citizen experience through user-driven design approaches, which is hosted by, um, co-hosted by OECD and the ICA. Um, I, as uh, he mentioned, I'm Martha Doris from the U.S., and I've worked with ICA for many, many years and in the U.S. government in the area of citizen experience and um, customer experience and citizen services for over 15 years. So we have four speakers today, um, two from Canada, then Denmark and Belgium, and um, they're going to share some examples of how they have implemented user-centered user design techniques to create citizen services. Um, we have a couple logistics. Um, we have um, each speaker will have about 10 minutes and then we'll have 30 minutes at the end for, um, for questions and answers. So if you could hold your questions until the end, and we will make the presentations um, available if they haven't been already. Um, but I'd like to turn it over um, now to um, our chair of ICA from um, Japan to give a, a short welcome, and then we'll move right on to OECD. Thank you, Martha. Um, this is Toshi Zama, uh, Chair of the ICA. So thank you for coming to the uh, joining us to the ICA and OECD Web Seminar Conference. So I'm very glad and uh, I'm very surprised that we have around 50 attendees over 30 countries. It's very amazing. I think this it this shows that the, this topic, user experience and the season experience, is very very important key topic for the, every country. So, uh, thank you for coming again, and the, uh, please enjoy the uh, please enjoy the presentation from the four four good speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Toshi. OECD, are you guys okay? Or do you want to say a few words? Uh, hi, Marta. Just say a few words to welcome um, everybody. We are also extremely um, happy. So I just would like to uh, join Toshi in uh, expressing our uh, positive surprise in seeing how many uh, delegates are participating in this, uh, in this webinar today. We just had our e-leaders in Estonia, and we will soon head to Medellin for the ICA meeting. And I really think that the organization of these webinars has been a very interesting example um, that show how important it is to keep the interaction and the discussion and the exchanges live, even in between meetings. First of all, because I think there are many things happening in the 12 months between meetings. And second, because this offers us the opportunity to bring on board many more uh, civil servants, many more people working on projects and uh, being part of the teams, whereas uh, often just one or two people get to travel to the various destinations. So I think there's no need for me to repeat how important it is for the OECD to work with delegates because the knowledge we produce could not be produced if we could not get data, information, and exchanges with you. But we really would like you to make the most out of these webinars also for your own um, interest, meaning we really think that uh, we all are very much behind the discussion on user-driven approaches. This is something we embedded in our recommendation. The big focus, and I think the big value added of having these webinars, is really to focus on making it concrete, so hearing about concrete examples and things being done by countries, making it personal, meaning maybe talking and identifying who is making it happen, and third, making it valuable meaning trying to understand how these initiatives are actually impacting, for instance, the service quality and the level of satisfaction of uh, the citizens and businesses with the services we uh, provide. Having said this, I don't want to make it longer because I think the space, this space is for you guys. Um, so I just wish that this transforms and, and unveils into a rich exchange. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll get started. Um, at this point, and I just wanted to say a, a couple of words about how, um, you know, the, the, the discipline of, of citizen and customer experience is really important, and the, 
the, um, the use of uh, your users or citizens in the design of your services, as we're talking today, is, is critical because their expectations are changing faster than we can keep up with it. And that's basically uh, driven by the, it, their consumer experience and their private lives. So we know that, that the, the experience is really um, driving the, the, the uh, movement across, you know, across the, around the world in digital transformation. So this is really understanding your customers and citizens is a, the major part of designing good services that they're going to use. So with that, I, will, um, I think we'll go ahead and kick it off by turning it over to our speakers from Canada. We have um, Ryan Andersoft and Alana McDonald, uh, McDougall. Um, Ryan is an uh, international expert on digital government and a passionate advocate for the increase in effective use of social media, collaborative technologies, and open data in the public sector. Ryan's had many um, different um, areas of uh, work experience, including time at the OECD and many areas in the, in the Canadian Treasury Board Secretariat. Um, has a master's in public administration from Harvard. Um, he, more than we can we we can uh, go through. So then Alana um, has worked at the Immigration, um, Refugee, and Citizenship Canada since 2002, and is currently the director of the service strategy. Prior to that, she worked in the areas of citizenship uh, policy and immigration or immigrant integration policy. She has degrees in political science, linguistics, linguistics linguistics uh, and immigrant settlement studies. And um, I know, in, at least in the U.S., we all know how important the immigration um, work is, so I'm anxious to hear what they have to say. And I will turn it over to, um, to Ryan. And we'll, um, you guys have about 10 minutes. Great. Thanks so much. Um, you can all hear us okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so thanks so much for the opportunity this morning uh, to be able to talk with you a little bit about how we're using uh, user-centric design principles in the federal government in Canada. Um, I'm just going to share the screen here and uh, put our presentation up for you. Um, hopefully you can all uh, see this now. Um, so I'll start this off, and, and Alana, I'll turn the floor over to her in a couple of minutes to go into some details on this. Um, but what I was privileged to be able to do a couple of uh, months ago was participate in a project that we were doing jointly with IRCC, our Immigration Department and the federal government, um, as well as with uh, our Central uh, Innovation Lab, which is based out of our Privy Council office or our cabinet office in Canada. Um, and through this process, we were able to do um, a unique process of applying user-centric design principles to looking at how we improve the user experience in one of the areas of business for the immigration department, which in this case was specifically around family sponsorship. So somebody who's sponsoring a spouse to come to Canada. Now, I work for our federal chief information officer in the government of Canada, um, and one of the areas that we're responsible for is service policy across the government. So this was a really unique experience for me to be able to be part of this process and see how user-centric approaches could be applied in the real world. And I think, as you'll see, some really interesting and innovative approaches can come out of this when applying that type of lens. So what do we mean by human-centered design? Um, when we talk about human-centered design, it's really about how do we put citizens at the center of everything we do in terms of how we design public programs and how we design policies and services for them. Um, those pictures on the right-hand side of your screen, this is, a, this is a local coffee shop in Ottawa called Bridgehead. And you know, I'm sure you've all had this experience with, with coffee, um, maybe less so in Europe because you drink higher class coffee out of, out of actual mugs. Um, but North American coffee in the paper cups, so often you put the lid on and it drips down the side. Um, and on the bottom right, you see the little note from them saying, you know, does your cup leak? It means essentially you haven't put the lid on properly. It, it's an example of a company actually saying that the users are stupid and the users aren't using their cup properly, as opposed to actually understanding what to use actually need 
and how do you make the puck work for them, not make customers try and make it work for the company itself. And it's a big shift in terms of how we design things to really take that user-centric approach and understand what the pain points are that users are going through and be able to address those issues. So we were fortunate in the Government of Canada, we have a number of people who have real expertise in human-centered design. Um, and they were able to be brought in to work with our immigration department to look at how we could improve this particular line of business. Um, so we launched what was called the Family Class uh, Design Challenge, which was a three-week intensive experience where we had a team of 10 people from the immigration department, uh, our couple of design experts from our central innovation hub and myself from Treasury Board, who spent the first week of that period on the road. We went and talked to clients. We spent time in the call center in Montreal, listening to live calls from clients, went to the case processing center near Toronto to look through the work with applicants or work with agents who were going through applications. We met with um, NGOs, with groups that are helping applicants, and even did street interviews with random people on the street to understand their experience going through uh, the family sponsorship process. And then we applied a number of different design methodologies. This is just a bit of a sample of a few of them on the screen um, to, to get to really dig into the insights we had gotten from clients and to be able to identify where the pain points were and how we could think about approaching this area of service in a bit of a different way. Uh, and from that, I think we're able to come up with a number of a fascinating um, uh, insights that even for people who worked in this field for years wasn't readily apparent to them at the beginning of the process. So I'm going to turn over to my colleague Alana who will talk through what we came out of this process and some of the insights that we found. <laughs> so of the insights that we developed, you can see here on this slide a lot of the different ways that we kind of brought the information together to look at issues around how the system worked, what worked, what some of the common themes we've heard about, what some of the common, common themes were in the specific stories. but. Um, of the insights, this is the slide that we've, I think we've used the most in the department that's been the most interesting. And this is looking at what were the pain points that we heard from clients when we went out and we just asked them to tell their stories. What were the themes that came out of just, you know, just purely listening to their stories? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm the Director of Service Strategy at the Immigration Department. And in the last couple of years, we as a department, I think, have done a lot of work to try to improve our, our data, our qualitative data, our quantitative data. Um, we have a uh, client satisfaction online web form that was just launched a couple of years ago. So clients send us emails about their, their, uh, their service experience. Uh, we've launched regular client satisfaction surveys, so we go out not just to the squeaky wheels, but we go out to a, 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 a sample of all of our clients to ask about their experience. Um, but in the, the qualitative realm, there are, because we're just hearing from the squeaky wheels, we're not necessarily hearing everybody's story. And on the client satisfaction survey, we are, of course, we're asking people questions, and those questions are necessarily grounded in our assumptions about what the right questions are to ask. Um, so this, this ethnographic approach to getting information from or, or from hearing from clients uh, going through the human-centered design process was both powerful but also very interesting in these, in these pain points that we pulled. They were different. They were different than what we heard from the, from the qualitative and the quantitative information we gathered. So, for example, there was an assumption in our department that, you know, what clients really care about, they want to be able to get people here faster. They, processing time is, you know, the biggest thing that our clients care about. And that was reflected in, in a lot of the emails that we get from people as well. But when we just listen to people's stories, actually processing times were quite low down the pain points that they talked about, their biggest pain point was the black box of not knowing what happened to their application after they mailed it to us. Um, and especially a black, uh, the, the black box that happened in the first month or so when they had, they had spent months gathering their information, gathering their application, and sending it to us. And it might be a number of weeks before they actually got a letter from us acknowledging that we would received their application. So we heard time and time again that that that, that huge gap and just knowing, did you even get my package was one of the biggest pain points. And that is not something that we ever thought to ask a question about in, uh, in surveying. Um, so better understanding our client's reality, better understanding their pain points and um, uh, undermining our own assumptions, uh, uh, going through a process that caused us to put our own assumptions to the side was incredibly powerful. 
um, and has already led to a number of different uh, policy and program changes within the department, not just for the family class, but, but across other lines of business as well, other different kinds of applications that we did. So that part was really important. Um, but the third week of the process we went through, we actually spent a whole week just trying to come up with some ideas. What are some, what, what, what were some easy fixes that were going to cost a lot of money uh, that we might be able to apply to address some of those power points, some of those pain points. And I'll tell you, I have been in many a boardroom as a bureaucrat over the course of my career, brainstorming for an hour or two, oh, what can we do about, you know, clients probably don't like this. What can we do to fix this? What can we do to fix that? The difference in A, spending a week thinking about ideas, but also spending a week after having so grounded your understanding of the issues and what clients actually care about and what clients have actually told us. Uh, resulted in much higher caliber and real ideas that 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 came out of that came out of that process. Um, so there was five ideas. And I'm just checking the time. Yeah, I've got a minute. Um, uh, we came up with five very strong ideas that were well received. I think we'll talk quickly about two of them because they're two things that are being uh, uh, worked on currently. Um, well, I'll talk about the phone. How do you want to talk about technique? Sure. Uh, so one of the things that we heard. Uh, from clients was this, and, it, and it's the, it comes from the same point of um, the, the black box, not knowing what was happening with their application, this incredible diet desire for assurance, just assurance that things were okay, assurance that things were moving the way they were supposed to be. And because they weren't getting that assurance, it was leading to the behaviors that were costing us money. So uh, people filing additional information for privacy requests, contacting the members of parliament, um, so, looking at how could we actually give people assurance, uh, the assurance that they were craving without going through the more expensive channels. So, we piloted, so, so we d developed a proposal for and are actually now piloting something called the phone hug, where we've totally changed the, both the tone and the kind of information that people are getting from our call center if they call us looking for information on their case file, whereas previously we would only go into their file if the person had passed the processing time. Uh, we've, we've now instructed agents to say, oh, very happy to help you. Sure, actually go into their file, even if, they, if processing times haven't been passed, and give that assurance, yeah, I can see your file. It's in front of me. Everything is okay. And within a couple of weeks of that pilot uh, being launched, we saw repeat callers, the, the callers who are the majority of the callers that were calling you know, three, four, or five times to say, where's my case, where's my case. Repeat callers dropped by 35%. Uh, so it takes an extra 30 seconds for the agent to actually go into the file, but the overall system costs have gone down because people aren't calling back as often. So the phone hug was pilot one. Yeah, and the other quick idea, which I'll mention that we're working with IRC to see the pilot, is about a text message alert system. So one of the challenges was because this application process is still paper-based, there is a lag between when the mailroom receives it and when it actually is able to be reviewed and put into the system. Um, and people were having a lot of phone calls coming into the call center and IRCC specifically about, have you received my application? Is it there? Um, and so what we're working with is actually to do a very kind of lightweight uh, barcode system where they fill out this paper-based application. They would have a barcode that they essentially put on the top of the application and the mailroom would put a new procedure in place. Then they receive a package, they scan the barcode, and people get a text message that same day letting them know that it's been received and is in the queue. Um, and what's nice about this and from our perspective from a government-wide office is that as we're working to pilot this with this one business line in our immigration department, if this works, which I'm confident it will, um, this same process could be applied for any paper-based application in any department across the government of Canada. And that's one of the, I think, the really interesting things about this is these kind of insights you can find from one particular service area, but they can be potentially scaled and replicated across the entire system. So I know we're short on time, so we'll leave it at there for now, but I hope this has been helpful for people, and uh, we look forward to the rest of the conversation and hearing the other presentations. Thank you so much. I think all of us probably um, saw the fact that you can scale it across Canada, but every country has the same exact issues, and to see what you guys learned in you know a couple of weeks of doing this research and uh, and actually talking to your your users um, what it can result in so I look forward to um, questions at the end um, I think we're going to go right now over to Mr. Bald Harriman in um, Belgium who's the IT service manager for FedEx which is the Belgian Federal Public Service for ICT 
Um, he's from the telecom sector and he's the product owner and service manager for the public sector ecosystem. Um, he's going to explain how Belgium has adapted its public sector back office infrastructure um, to the citizen industry oriented ecosystem to deliver a better user experience. So thank you again to um, our colleagues from Canada and we'll go over to um, Belgium. Okay. I will, can you see uh, my screen now? We can I see your can, screen. Yeah. Oh, you can hear me. Fine. Okay, so I'll go uh, directly into the presentation. Um, I think it's quite uh, important to note what we're presenting here is our approach. So this is essentially a very iterative exercise and we have not yet landed at any destinations and probably we will never win. So what you will see on the coming slides is that say 75% slideware, 15% proofs of concept and about 10% actual pilot implementation. So it's important to know these are many principles being presented, but we haven't done it all. So maybe some background. Uh, Belgium, like Canada, is a federal country and there are many different combinations of accountable administrations whenever, uh, as, a citizen, as a citizen, you're confronted with a life event. And these combinations are not predictable and typically not understood. So it's very hard for citizens to understand which government to connect to whenever they need something. Often the governments themselves don't know it and even quality media, they often make mistakes. An example of that uh, is that uh, in, in my, about five minutes of web surfing, I found like seven different portals that all pretend to be a single point of entry for government services. This, of course, leaves the citizen totally puzzled and very frustrated by uh, mainly the online experience of uh, getting information out of the um, with regards to the requests and, and, and follow up on their, their cases. So when we went to look and see why we think this one size does not fit all, we came to the uh, conclusion that uh, money is totally spent in silos in our country and it's even legally complicated to spend money across silos. It's actually illegal. So I cannot make a service that's uh, benefits a region because the region is financed in its own way and uh, that uh, as a consequence leads to um, very diverse technological supplier and solution choices rooted in the traditions of each administration in its own. So um, this leads to admin-centered e-government where the return on investment is purely measured in public servant units and not really in citizen units. So we try to uh, make life of our public servants easier, but we don't really, are not really looking at how we help our citizens. And integration with other units and integration with other uh, administrations is seen as some, something to avoid because it's risky and it causes delay. And as a consequence, we have very few standardization and reuse. So as you saw, uh, those seven different portals, they all handle the same same life events, but present them slightly differently. Um, at the same time, and you probably all know about that, we're confronted with uh, a, a, um, call it a climate in which we have to reduce costs. And various synergy programs have been launched in the last years to cut costs and to cut administrative overhead. And these have all been focused on basically creating synergy on the side of the investment rather than on the side of the return. Luckily, let's say some awareness of the actual societal cost of call it non-user centric interaction is now emerging. So, um, and also the administrations are slowly learning that by working in an admin centered way, it, it becomes virtually impossible to transfer those low value added interactions that uh, uh, citizens often have with their uh, uh, administration into call it basically self-services which are operated by the citizen themselves. Um, what did we try to do? Well, we started thinking about it and uh, a few years ago there was a very good initiative in Belgium 
called the federal portal called belgium.be and there about 10,000 pages of static content were recorded explaining how to interact with your um, uh, your government services on the different levels. Uh, however, it became obviously clear that this was impossible to maintain and the rate of change and the rate of uh, renewal in all those services is so big that uh, those uh, editors became very frustrated and couldn't keep uh, that information up to date. So uh, we decided to try to make an approach, call it an ecosystem, where there are a bunch of facilitators available uh, that make it actually easier and cheaper, cheaper for administrations to follow standards than to continue acting on their own. And through that, we hope uh, and we are trying to indeed uh, make uh, service delivery and user experience at the same time more coherent and consistent while maintaining decentralized business ownership, which is like legally uh, um, call it encrusted in, in our society. Um, why, what we try to do is like to, to link static content and uh, web applications to interactive services uh, in an intuitive manner. So um, we are an ICT organization, so we make a technical plans. So we started from an architecture that's based on the uh, European interoperability reference architecture and we took the standards of the European interoperability framework as principles and recommendations. So these are standards that, okay, you should reuse backends, that all whatever you do online must be accessible for people with a handicap uh, and so on, and that you should think in a user-centered way and design in a user-centered way that's actually written down in, those, uh, in that framework. Um, and on top of that, we created a number of reusable solution building blocks, um, which we're rolling out at this moment. So these building blocks, what would that be? Like it's, for example, metadata as, as linked open data. So that enables content syndication. So when, whenever you release an application or release a page of information, the metadata is linked to the owners, is linked to the teams, is linked to the uh, geographic regions where uh, this uh, application is built for. Easy connections to horizontal services. We have a fairly good federal authentication system which is available to all citizens of this country. And we have a, a, a service bus that connects like different backends of different uh, organizations. We uh, try to demonstrate that these things actually work by doing proofs of concepts. And uh, we have built this all on very portable infrastructure, basically cloud-based services that run in a containerized environment and that are easily transferable uh, from administration to administration. And last but not least, we are expanding a portfolio of framework contracts. So these uh, framework contracts, they allow application developments, interconnectivity, web services, and quality assurance, both on a technical, on an administrative level, as well as on the legal level, to be bought centrally and uh, allowing basically, uh, whenever somebody does a complex technological project, to have it audited in a standardized way to make sure that these things are built in an interoperable manner. So it's actually this ecosystem, we consider the glueware between the backend systems that exist in, at various levels of administration, which are never going to be able to be interconnected, and uh, basically the internet containing, uh, well, having the citizens uh, accessing the services. Here you see a little picture of it. Uh, wait, I will try to get a highlighter on it. So uh, what it's mainly about is this middle layer, and there you see that every application which we put in there is has to have an API that allows it to be uh, integrated into one or more portals. So that happens here. Uh, it has its own actual interface, which exposes more complicated, uh, um, call it uh, um, functions. And it also should expose the, its function. So what it does 
in the form of linked open data. If you look at a generic application, I said like, okay, it's fairly standard Java portal technology. Yeah? So it's like a simple portal that talks to the outside world, gives basic information about what is in the application. The actual uh, interface of itself, which is to be used by the citizen to interact. And then a, uh, a SOA layer, which is connected to backend services, which manage those intergovernmental uh, processes, such as integration and orchestration uh, over the service bus. Um, what have we brought into uh, a proof of concept there? It's a generic solution for web forms. We call it intelligent web forms. The intelligence is in the fact that it is, uh, it has the possibility to, via opt-in, access personalized data sources of the government and to use that information to pre-fill the form. Um, this became a very hot topic in the uh, beginning of this year because uh, in Belgium the federal uh, government passed a law that actually uh, forbids the government to ask twice for the same information. So that's quite revolutionary as you can imagine. So uh, we're in a, we've started a, a project to allow those so-called authentic sources of information of your address, of your company registration, of uh, previous files, accessible for reuse uh, in, in forms and, and other interactions, uh, simply because it's, uh, it's been passed as a law and, uh, well, until now, no citizen has uh, called it, uh, brought the state to court, but there is a risk that at some point the citizen says, like, okay, I'm not filling out this information because I filled it out in another form last week, and it's up to you to connect the dots and, uh, and, and complete my file for you. So this pilot, which is now running, basically contains reusable authentication which is available to all citizens and that uses SAML uh, technology for those who know. It communicates via the service bus via to SOAP and REST web services containing information from the national registry and so on. Uh, it uh, does pre-fills based on the national company register. It can get your personal information from the national register of persons which is something we have in this, in this country. And uh, on top of that, the forms which we make uh, are basically coded as content. So they're, they're very human readable files if you want, uh, at least files which are uh, readable for the informed human and somebody who can read a bit of code and can copy and paste can reuse whole sections. Paul, Paul this is Martha yeah. Doris. Um, I, we, we're um, a l like two minutes over time, so yes. I'd like to see if we okay. can uh, get it closed down in like yes. 30 seconds so we can turn it over to our colleague from Denmark. So, and uh, the most important fact, fact indeed is indeed that every application has its own metadata which can be linked into other systems. And for those who are interested, uh, it's all used on open standard and uh, open source technical components. And that actually is my uh, last slide. So uh, you can uh, bring it back to uh, the next speaker. Okay, thank you so much. I, I know, um, I'm sure everybody's kind of, their, their brains are spinning trying to figure out how they can use this, um, especially this only uh, providing your data, your, your personally identifiable information to the government one time. Um, so uh, at this point, let's turn it over to our colleague, Mr. Wang from Denmark. He's the head of the um, General, Director General Secretariat and is responsible for international cooperation at the Agency for Digitization within the Danish Ministry of Finance. And he's going to share with us the way that they have implemented a, a, a service. Are you satisfied with our services and it's a, a, a payment system in the way that, that Denmark is um, providing benefits to their citizens? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, there you go. Okay. Nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, uh, just a moment. Yes. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, the case here. 
the key, the case about uh, payment Denmark is actually a part of our activities to make public uh, digital public services mandatory to use online. And one of our main goals, and that's why uh, we are a part of the Ministry of Finance, is to uh, search for cost savings in uh, in our way of delivering services and operating in the public sector, and that's why we have uh, we have uh, uh, created a number of uh, service centres. And one of them is Payment Denmark, which is actually, uh, which is actually a big uh, payment uh, machinery. Uh, the Payment Denmark is uh, an, uh, 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 an, uh, a public sector agency, uh, uh, which has its own board uh, with us, the Ministry of Finance, uh, uh, in it. We are, uh, the payment Denmark is actually a part of, uh, sorry to you, to, to use uh, an acronym ATP, which is actually uh, the Danish labor market organization that administers a number of pension schemes on the, lab, uh, on the Danish labor market uh, with the Danish labor market parties as, uh, as owners, including the public sector. And what we did in um, in uh, let me see what we did in 2013, 2012, uh, the, the 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 decision was made that we would like to centralise uh, a number of public uh, uh, social security schemes plans, and uh, which has previously been handed uh, handled. And managed uh, by uh, locally by our municipalities. What we did uh, in 2013 was basically to uh, to uh, to take over, centralise all those uh, social security schemes, and put it in this agency, Payment Denmark. Uh, ATP. The reason for choosing. Uh, the the labor market uh, organization to take care of the payment uh, at that time was that it had a very efficient payment machinery uh, it 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 actually uh, manages assets for more than uh, 95 billion Euro, euros and therefore using this uh, machinery, uh, which already uh, runs smoothly and with high satisfaction rates uh, by uh, the different customers, the, 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 the different employees on the Danish labor market, uh, we wanted to tap into this machinery and use this backbone, this, uh, this back office uh, machinery uh, as, a, as a payment engine. The age, the agency Payment Denmark has uh, has actually quite a lot of customers. Uh, 2.3 million uh, citizens are actually customers one way or another. Those who receive social benefits, those who uh, are elderly and, and get pension, state pensions, uh, and uh, and and therefore uh, of a population of 5.6 million. Uh, uh, half of the Danish population actually has a relation, some way or another, with Payment Denmark. Uh, what we wanted to achieve uh, uh, was to see whether this way of making economy of scale could uh, uh, could ensure the cost savings that we, as the Minister of Finance, uh, were looking for, but also. Look, uh, very clearly looking at the challenge of whether we would we would lose uh, get uh, a lot of dissatisfied uh, citizens in the other end by this centralization uh, what is quite interesting to see uh, let me see what happens now what is quite interesting to see was what the agency took over was actually a very wide variety of uh, of uh, productivity. This example is uh, the uh, 
productivity of uh, of process uh, of processing uh, cases on housing benefits. And uh, there we saw uh, by taking over from 98 different municipalities, uh, very very big uh, differences in productivity uh, of of managing and 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 paying these uh, benefits. What is quite interesting is that uh, that uh, the payment Denmark has actually tried to uh, to monitor the productivity and of course also this is the the customer satisfaction and what we have seen since the takeover in uh, in 2013 uh, until last year uh, is a 40% improvement in productivity by uh, by uh, reaping the benefits of economy of scales without losing the high customer satisfaction that uh, were before having those uh, social services taken care of by uh, uh, by each of our municipalities. Um, this is just to give you a, a quick overview of some of the uh, the surveys that have been made by uh, by uh, Payment Denmark on the satisfaction. We have actually quite a, a, a large overall satisfaction, but uh, our citizens are complaining about too long time of processing, uh, processing time, uh, and of course, um, uh, but in general, we are quite satisfied with what we can see uh, uh, after the centralization uh, of these different uh, services uh, uh, to, uh, to this agency. Um, and the agency actually uses uh, uses uh, our central guidance uh, on on uh, user friendliness uh, as part of introducing mandatory services uh, in Denmark. Uh, we have demanded that each every one of the of the services put mandatory uh, put online for mandatory use by citizens and businesses. They have to uh, comply with uh, with uh, quite rigorous and detailed requirements on uh, user friendliness. For example, we have 11 requirements regarding language, regarding uh, regarding design, flow, and functionality. Uh, data components and standards, the uses of these, the making use, reuse of data already available using common component standards. And we have, of course, also uh, a number of uh, requirements on accessibility, including uh, accessibility, uh, internet accessibility requirements provided by W3C. Uh, for interested uh, parties, I can I can refer you to uh, to our architectural guide, uh, which has all the details. Unfortunately, only in Danish, um, but all the details are there for those who are especially interested. Um, just to give you uh, 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 examples, um, I just put this up. Whoops. Um, we are very much aware of uh, not to use bureaucratic language or for that say judicial legal language. Uh, we are very much looking into how we can ensure that that is a recognizability across the different services. Uh, we have not yet reached a common public sector agreement on a common look and feel of all services as the governance structure of Denmark is that we have a central government but our subnational government are actually fully independent by law and they can do whatever they want they have their own political uh, government uh, political elected boards uh, whether reach whether in the regions or in the municipalities but uh, we are working very closely together with our municipality in reaching some kind of a common understanding on how we can introduce uh, horizontally 
common looks and feels. Of course, having uh, uh, all the necessary helps online uh, functions in, uh, and, and similar functions in major browsers, etc., etc., etc. We have also used quite a lot of effort to have uh, joint campaigns uh, in the public sector, introducing mandatory services. Uh, mandatory for citizens and business to use online really puts special requirements on good communication uh, publicly and that's why we have put quite a lot of effort into uh, into into explaining to our citizens and businesses and especially to our citizens that there are uh, many different ways that you can get access I've uh, I've written uh, multi multiple channels, yes, you can access uh, the online service through multiple channels, but we actually have a one-channel strategy, and that is the digital channel only. Uh, we are trying to use a lot of um, uh, tools and trying, still trying to harmonize corporate identity across the public sector. And we are also trying to, uh, to, uh, to target different, uh, specific channels. One special challenge is our young persons, our young citizens. They are actually not on websites. They are on social media. They are on other platforms than our uh, traditional platform of, of websites. This put a very special challenge to us, and we are, we are in this current strategy period, period, strategy period looking into what we actually can do on that. And also that we have done quite a, a lot of effort to to have have uh, harmonised messages uh, and using our citizens national citizen portal for Ortico as an engine in that, ensuring that uh, that where, wherever the uh, citizens get access to uh, to to services, whether on the municip on the municipal citizens uh, uh, citizen portal or the national citizen portal they will get the same message and get the same looks and feel as far as possible um, I will not do too much about this uh, this is just a very quick overview uh, of um, of the way that we uh, that we work with agile uh, development uh, having uh, uh, having citizens or users very close into almost all phases of development, um, but just to uh, round off my uh, quick presentation, these this slide shows uh, an overview of the different common public sector uh, digital components that are used. Uh, in 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 all parts of our 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 digital service delivery, and what I've talked about is one specific component in a group of uh, common public sector components: the payment component, uh, our uh, shared service centre on uh, public sector payments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Um, I think it's um, we have about ten minutes to open it up for questions. Um, so I'll give everybody an opportunity to um, kind of think about a, uh, a question. Um, Mr. Wang, I did want to um, clarify one thing when you said the um, multi-channels and then you said digital channel only. Did I understand that this payments, the payment system is available in a digital channel only? Yes. Uh, yes, the services provided by Payment Denmark, uh, uh, their service, most of them, not all yet, but most of the, the services they have taken over and centralized are digital and digital only. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're... Uh Figuring out here these questions. Do we have any? Does anybody have any questions?
Okay, I'm going to I'm going to ask a question um, of the Canadian colleagues. Um, if I don't hear uh, any other questions, you you gave us two examples of the um, of the areas that you're working on, and you told us about the um, the area in terms of the black box. Were, do you have any other? Did you find any other big surprises when you went through your specific, you know, research and ethnographic research? Um, the importance of language and the uh, difference in the overall client experience when language is positive versus when language is negative. And sometimes we use negative language or difficult to understand language because of legislative requirements. Um, because of other reasons. But one example I'll give you uh, is in that pilot that we're doing at the call center. Uh, so we had actually put a message that everybody who calls the call center had listened to the way you might see in other, in, you know, at the airport or on a bus saying we don't accept harassing language if you uh, if you're rude or inappropriate with one of our agents, they may end the call. Um, and it was reflected back to us through the human center design process. The, the kind of almost the negative foot that we were putting forward by starting with that message. So we have actually refused, we've, we've uh, taken that message down um, and now say, I can't remember exactly what the words are, but something like congratulations, we know that uh, you're entering an anxious time as you're applying, as you as submitted your application, we're here to help. And the number of harassing calls has actually drastically reduced. So the language that we had used in order to have foster positive experiences was actually having the opposite effect. But that welcoming language, welcoming tone uh, has a huge impact on the client experience. And, and I would just add the other thing I think for me that really struck me was that, you know, we, we had, I think there was an assumption that the waiting times is the be all and end all, right? That if you can reduce the waiting times, that solves everybody's issues. And in fact, I think one of the things we discovered through the process was it's not, waiting times are important in terms of how long it takes to process an application, but part of it is about keeping people occupied through that time. I mean, this is something thing that if you go to Disney, to a Disney theme park, they have gotten down to a science in terms of they know you're going to have a certain amount of time waiting in line, but they find ways to give you information to keep you occupied so that it doesn't feel like it takes half an hour, right? And so in our case, part of I think what we were, we were uncovering through this human center design process is that maybe it's okay if it does take a year or two years to go through the whole application process, but what doesn't work is this black box as we yeah. just, you know, discovered where you put an application in and then you're just sitting waiting for up to a year, if not longer, to hear back anything. And, that, and that's an important nuance I think that was really yeah. interesting to discover. And really important for, from an investment perspective. If you've got an, a limited amount of money and you can invest in making your process 5% shorter, or you can invest that same amount of money in texting people to say we got your application, for the client, for, from the client's perspective, it's a better investment to do it in communicating than reducing by a short amount. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. I, I do. I, uh, to me, the point here, too, is that the, the citizen um, experience is the full journey from before they need it to through the end of the transaction. And so, and so determining what matters to your customers is really important so you know how to prioritize your resources and then measure that entire journey as well as then, you know, by, um, by specific touch points. Um, thank you. We have a couple questions that have come in. The first one from Denmark to, I mean, uh, um, to, for Denmark on how are your citizens actually involved in the design and testing phases from um, Timothy and uh, hopefully I won't butcher this too much, Shalatko. Yes. Um it differs quite a lot uh, uh, depending on uh, who is in charge of the development. But for Payment Denmark, they have uh, they have a system where they actually uh, have a user representation uh, in in the different phases of uh, of. Um, of uh, of of the bit of the development uh, both in the in the initial phases with the analysis of customer needs or or citizens needs or user needs 
uh, requirements regarding uh, in, 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 in their cooperation with, uh, with, the, with the providers that, that have won tenders and, uh, and also regarding ins ensuring that we use the, uh, that they use the common public uh, uh, sector digitization components in order to, 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 uh, to um, uh, secure the interoperability uh, in the back office. But, but many of them uh, are, uh, are, are a part of the different development phases, both in the initial uh, analysis and also uh, also uh, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in the different phases of, of development. We have actually um, uh, we have actually uh, in our cooperation with with, with private uh, with private providers. Uh, um, and, and, and agile uh, contractual uh, concept that allows for uh, for um, for uh, rapid development uh, and uh, in that in those phases uh, making use of um, of, um, of of citizens involvement. Uh, this is something that we have. Uh, this is a system of uh, contractual co uh, contracts that we have uh, tested out uh, the, the previous uh, couple of years, and uh, eight, uh, uh, this agency has has adopted uh, 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 this approach in order to ensure. Uh, quick development uh, and uh, where you have the citizens as part uh, as uh, of 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 the development uh, process or representative of citizens as, as part of the development process. Thank you. Um, we we have a question from Colombia um, for um, uh, let's see no. Where is it at? Um, it's it's about it's it's from uh, Costa Rica and it's around surveys and the types of surveys that you use. Um, do you use surveys that are um, you know in the mail? Do you use surveys that are on the street? Um, and and I don't. I guess this is for everyone, but um, I know at least here in the U.S. Not that I was asked the question. We do all kinds of different types of surveys depending on who your customers are, and I think taking a look at specifically who your customers are, for example, as they mentioned in Denmark, when you have a, a, a customer base that's of a certain age, you may even use a social media kind of strategy. But um, we can get, we'll get some uh, comments from Canada and anyone else that, that wants to um, chime in about the types of surveys. Sure. So, you know, I think from the Canadian perspective, um, there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer to that question right now across the federal government. I think it's fair to say every department has different approaches in varying degrees in terms of how they get customer feedback and get customer satisfaction information. This is actually one of the things from a Treasury Board perspective we're looking at right now. Um, one of the mandate commitments we have from our new government is around putting in place performance metrics for service. Um, and so I think that's something that we're looking at and the government's taking very seriously right now is how do you have common ways that you can be able to measure how services, how, how effective they are, and also uh, user experience and user feedback um, and reflections on that. But it is different from different places. I know, Alana, IRCC, I think you do a mix of different types yeah. of surveys right now. Yeah, we do do, as, uh, as well as a variety of other ways of getting information, gathering data, we do do a client satisfaction survey that's, uh, that's web-based, so emails go out to client immigration department. We have clients all around the world you know, uh, first language, multiple different languages. So we do do that call out. But of course, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, when you're doing surveying, you are asking questions based on your own assumptions. So surveys are a great tool. They're a great tool when you know the questions that you want to get answers to, but they are not the way to get at your blind spots. Yeah, and that's, I think that was one of the really big lessons learned from applying that user-centric design process we talked about for this case study, was that it teaches you that you have to walk in 
not assuming you know what the questions are that you need to ask and not assuming that you know what the problems are. So I think it really is a mix of that. And that's something that we're very interested in is how do we take kind of the traditional survey methodology, which governments have used in a variety of forms, but also build into the culture of how we do service design and delivery, this notion of really being user centric, which means sometimes you have to leave your assumptions at the door and walk in with a very open mind to understand what's going on. So it sounds like a multifaceted approach where you uncover through certain types of research the problems and then you can ask what the issues are and try to gauge those depending on the, the channel that you're, you're um, working in. Um, yeah. Thank you. So we have um, a, a, a question for, um, from Columbia about, um, I think this is for Canada um, and Denmark. Do you have common guidelines for designing services that have to be followed by all public agencies? Um, so from the Canadian standpoint, so we have a service policy for the Government of Canada. So it sets kind of broad parameters and frameworks for all services uh, and departments are evaluated on that. Um, on a regular basis, um, but it hasn't, it's not at kind of a very um, minute level of design yet. Um, so I think there's broad principles that all services are supposed to live up to, including a degree of user centricity. Um, to date, we have not taken the approach that, for example, the United Kingdom and others have done, where they have a specific design standard for all digital services, for example, to go through. Uh, but again, it's something that we're looking at actively right now as we look at how do we improve services across the federal government um, to be able to bring some coherence to that and to bring some of these approaches in it. But I think in the Canadian perspective, and recognizing too with our system of government, the federal government by itself has over a hundred different departments and agencies. Plus in our context, provincial governments have a lot of responsibility for service delivery. Um, so it's much more of a collaborative approach than it is necessarily always a one size fits all. Are those, um, those broad design principles available online? So on, we can make this available if you want to distribute it afterwards, but our the service policy for the federal government is, is available online and uh, we can share that afterwards. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Denmark, did you have anything to add to that? About yes, uh, just uh, I, I think uh, in, in my slides I, I showed you that we have uh, guidelines, but our interaction is actually not as uh, not so much with other authorities on that is is this actually more with private companies uh, who have won tenders and 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 need some guidelines on how to proceed with uh, uh, with the, the the development of the systems so we actually have quite a lot of dialogue with the private sector uh, on how to approach uh, the, the 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 user centricity issue and that's why also we have quite an elaborated uh, set of demands, as I explained in my uh, brief uh, presentation, uh, to how uh, how uh, digital public digital uh, services uh, uh, should be developed and how they should appear. Uh, one issue that we have not covered uh, and that has I think has shown as a common, especially European Union. Uh, uh, challenge is the user journey, the, the use of services across uh, in, 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 in different life events. Uh, we have in our strategy period focused very much on single services, but what we now see as increasing criticism actually is that it is still difficult to use services across different authority boundaries. So optimizing on single services uh, need to be expanded, and this is a part of our current stra uh, strategy period, have to be expanded uh, to look at how user friendliness uh, are, are improved uh, in the user journey. Thank you. Um, I think we're hearing some feedback here, but um, thank you, um, Mr. Wang. We have a question from the Netherlands 
Um, to the Canadians about the, the information that you collected by going to your contact center and uh, you know how many people kind of went and is that a common practice? And I would just say that my experience in the U.S. has been that the contact centers are highly underused in terms of the data and information that you can collect on what your citizens want from government because that's one of the only places where you, unless you're doing face-to-face -face interactions, where your, your government um, you know, customer service reps touch the citizen every day and, and connecting the, the um, finding out what matters to your customers through the contact centers is, is a big way that we're pushing here and it's still not, uh, it's, it's still under, I think undervalued as a resource. But um, I'll turn it over to Canada for your comments. Uh, so as part, of, as part of our design challenge, all 10 of the participants went to the call center and we spent a day just listening in to live calls. Um, but I will say I totally agree, underutilized resource. And as part of the, one of the things that we learned, how important it was for our process to listen to calls, we're actually now uh, in the process of putting together a kiosk with call recordings with personal information stripped from them that we can use at our headquarters with a whole range of different calls. So a kiosk that we're going to put in a public space so staff can go at any point and, you know, if they work on citizenship policy, well, they can click on citizenship calls and, you know, spend as long as they want listening to those. So making, even if they're not live, but making recordings of calls stripped of personal information available more broadly, um, we think will have a big impact. And it's, you know, it's not even just headquarters, I think, for a department, but even for us as a central agency, so Treasury Board Secretariat. Oh, you're going to come to the kiosk, are you? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, come to the kiosk, but I think even with our team, you know, for me to be able to participate in this process, the rest of our service policy team is actually now doing site visits with a number of our service departments to get out to the top floor, so to speak, and see what's happening. And I think it's really important because I think, you know, for any central agency in government that has that policy setting role around service, there in large organizations like governments, you can sometimes get quite far away from what's actually happening on the ground. And I think it's been really instructive for us, for every, anybody who's working on service policy issues, to spend some time to actually go out on the front lines talking to clients and talking to the people who are dealing with clients every day. It just gives you a better nuance and a better perspective on how you can set policies that are going to actually work and are going to actually be able to help clients. It also gives you input to feed to the website, you know, the online side, so that you start shifting people from the call center over to your online side. So um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, okay, we've got one more um, from from uh, the, from let's see. Um, we've got one on privacy and security is a big issue. Um, Anybody have anything to comment on how do you manage and protect users' information to provide easy access to services? And I think this is going to be our last question, so um, anybody that wants to chime in on the privacy security issue, which we all know is like huge. Well, this is uh, Bolt Hedeman from Belgium here. I would like to respond to that. Basically, indeed, it's, it's a big issue. And the way we are trying to tackle it is that uh, whenever an individual accesses information or whenever uh, one government needs to access information which is stored in, in, uh, in the back ends of, an, of another uh, government agency, that it has to pass through the hands of the individual. So uh, here we have a few legal restrictions there. So uh, we have a, uh, an instance called the Privacy Commission that have to give approval for any back-end to back-end uh, integration between uh, databases. And uh, the way we want to be able to offer digital services while still maintaining privacy is to uh, always make it via opt-in. So basically, uh, a citizen identifies himself, accesses his or her own private personal information, and applies that information in another context for another business finality. Um, that's the way we have been uh, trying to tackle it. And of course, whenever things are, are stored or, or uh, processed there, they're, it's all happening on encrypted systems, of course. So that uh, should cover the security okay. aspects. Thank you. Um, I think at this point we're going to um, kind of 
close the webinar down. And I just wanted, to, from my standpoint, thank everybody, um, our speakers, so much for your time and effort in putting together your presentations and sharing your information with everyone. And to the participants, and I would um, highly recommend that we all kind of think about how we would like to move forward on this topic. It's a real passion of mine. And um, so from the ICA and OECD perspective, um, you know, how we can continue this conversation even after the conference in, uh, in Columbia, which I know we're going to continue it there. So um, uh, let me turn it over to Toshi to see if, do you have any closing remarks from ICA? Marissa, thank you, Marissa, and thank you for everyone. So uh, joining, join, I'm sorry, uh, join to the uh, conference. It's very, very, I think it's very useful. And the, also, I'm sorry, just bowing to my dog. We've all been there, no problem. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, actually so it's midnight in Japan, but the my eyes very open because the very uh, exciting story I heard from the four great speakers uh, in the next November we will share the our experience in the Colombia Medellin. So please join us and the, please continue continue to uh, contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, OECD, take it away. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's been very interesting. We called it the beginning for trying to make it concrete, personal, and valuable. And I think we heard really concrete examples. We heard comments from people who've tried to make it work, and we heard how this is impacting or not the user satisfaction. And I think, you know, there's one point that I think Denmark brought up in the presentation, which is about the digital natives, meaning people who are pushing the boundaries of the challenges the um, digital opportunities are putting, are laying um, in front of us for, for uh, all of us who are working with ideas and implementation of new ways of delivering services. And I really think, I agree with Martha, this is just the beginning of a conversation that we would like to see continuing in the next 12 months and um, uh, beyond the, uh, the meetings that um, have just taken place in Estonia or it's coming up in Medellin. So thank you to all of you for this very rich uh, uh, interaction and discussion. Thank you. Good night, good morning, and uh, we'll see you guys later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.